Kia ora and welcome to the Disrupt Ed interviews. I'm Steve Mouldy and today we are lucky enough to be joined by a, um, a well, an education disruptor for many years, Chris Clay. Welcome, Chris. Kia ora, Steve. Kia ora, everybody. How are you? Um, for those that haven't um, possibly come across you in the education sphere before, Chris, could you explain a little bit about your background and what it is that you do now? Yep. Um... <clears throat> As you will probably tell from my voice, I'm from the north of England originally, but I'm proper Kiwi with a book and everything. Been here for uh, around uh, 15, 16 years now. Um, I'm a recovering high school science teacher. Last proper job in a school was uh, at Botany Down Secondary College as head of science. One of the team that to set up the Mind Lab, uh, did that for two years. And then as of 2015, I've been doing education and consultancy uh, around sort of future focused education stuff which has nothing to do with technology or entrepreneurship, um, but is more related to how can we support teachers as they think about um, practicing in ways that considers their classroom more like an ecosystem rather than a, a room full of individual people that need to be dealt with individually. Um, so um, yeah, so these days do consultancy and education and a lot of stuff around strategy and future stuff for um, non-education groups as well. And I mean, obviously, the situation that we're in at the moment has led to a lot of people kind of starting to ask those questions about, man, what is it that we that we should be doing here? And I know we've had a lot of conversations recently about that urgency versus that strategic yep. side of things. And I'd really like to hear a, a little bit from you around, you know, for us that are well, for school leaders, but also for teachers in the classrooms, what what are the things that you think should be at the top, at the forefront of our minds at the moment? Okay, um, so I'll try and keep this re relatively brief, but feel free to interrupt me as I go on, okay? okay? Um, so I, I guess the first thing is, is that I think it's really awesome that we are acknowledging this as an opportunity to innovate, because it really is. Um, there's some people I work with that are suggesting that this is what might be called a systems reset or an inflection point, or an opportunity for transformation, and all those things I think are absolutely true. I think what we need to do though, is amongst all the kind of urgency and eagerness to kind of stand in there and fix everything and get it all better, um, I think we need to just pause for just a, a moment in time and just kind of think about things, uh, or think about the way that we think about things. So there's a, a saying around the lines of, what we know limits what we can imagine. And I think, that that's really pertinent at this, at this point in time because I think we've got a situation where we've had lots of agendas, lots of things that we've been really keen to bring about, lots of changes that we've been really keen to bring about. So they were all changes that we were kind of thinking about for a long time. Then this hit, and we now want to kind of get in there and, and enact those changes. And I think the, the idea of me saying that we need to pause and think about the way we think about things is to sort of think about why we wanted those things why they maybe were relevant and then ask the question of are they relevant now so that's sorry some of those changes that they're talking about there that's the things like student agency and some of those other buzzwords i guess that have been floating around education for the last few years yeah yeah so i mean my take on this is that a lot of the stuff that we've been really uh, aiming for and driving th so things like student-centered education possibly uh, whilst i'm not saying it's necessarily bad you know there's obviously <laughs> lots of great things about catering to people's needs and, and and all that kind of stuff um but a lot of the other stuff so for example the move towards kind of a focus on entrepreneurship and design thinking and, and that kind of stuff creating creating value uh, also things around prioritizing certain subject areas so prioritizing stem digital tech those kind of things over for example the arts, the humanities, health education. Um, and the background of that being that that those agendas, those those priorities, those those things that we kind of want to bring about are really connected to education's purpose as something that supports continued economic growth. And I think what we are finding through this is that actually maybe that's not what we want as a society as a civilization you know maybe this is the system's transition is to say actually what is education's purpose beyond that now i'm not i'm not suggesting for a second i want to be really clear here that all the people that are watching this are going into schools like you know urban capitalists wanting to kind of you know bring <laughs> it's, it's not stuff that we necessarily see 
Um, and, it, and that's why I think it needs us to pause and think about, well, why do we do what we want? Because we're part of the system. We're, we're you know, to use a kind of a harsh term, we're kind of indoctrinated by it. We've all, we all went through the similar sort of education system ourselves as kids. Uh, and so seeing some of this stuff is really, really hard. And it takes us a lot of effort to actually focus and be able to, to, be able to notice that in what we do. Um, so I think they're the kind of things that I'm really sort of thinking about in terms of being able to see why we think the way we do. And then if we can make that object to ourselves, we can start to reimagine other things. So does this sort of cut closer to some of the conversations around what is success and what is it that we really want for our kids coming through the schools and through the system? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I, even the language there is like, what do we want for our kids? Is 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 important to acknowledge, like right? because obviously education is about kids, but it's not just about kids, right? It's about it's about the future that we're creating because our kids are going to get older and then they're going to do other stuff, um, and it's also about the society we want to create. We can't decouple as much as we our mindsets think about this. Decouple education from everything else. Yeah. So uh, as we, we you and I were talking the other week. Um, the idea of, say, for example, like the climate strikes, you know, the, the, the idea that we'll have kids go out and they'll they'll campaign and they'll pressure the government to change their policies towards carbon emissions and all this sort of stuff. And then these kids can go back to education. You know, that in some respect, if that's the, the idea that some people have, it, it misses the point that education is part of the problem in terms of the climate. You know, like it, it, it brings about certain things that mean certain policies are, you know, certain, certain practices are more likely to continue to take place. Um, you know, like our, our schools in themselves are quite decent emitters of carbon, you know, people driving all the way to work, big catchment zones, um, you know, maybe they're not as, as renewable as they could be. These aren't criticisms. It's just the fact that schools exist to, to create futures, to shape society. Um, so it's not just necessary to meet the needs of kids, but it's to meet the needs of everything. It's to meet the needs of everybody. Um, okay and the planet yeah well i think that and, and, and this is probably the point i really want to make i think in terms of this reimagination in terms of this transformation um is that when we think of when we think of education being student or person centric personalized which i think often gets termed as it ends up being individualized you know for yeah. for whether we think about that or are conscious of it or not and um, we're really what we're doing is we're using a human centered approach to the design of our system. Yeah. And there's lots of good things about being human centered. There's also the idea that and as people have, uh, have often acknowledged the fact that it's not usually generally human centered, it's some human centered, right? So, it's usually, you know, white wealthy people, for example, as opposed to people that, uh, you know, of, of other ethnic groups. And um, so there's that part of it, but also is the idea that many of the problems that we face have a civilization at the moment, are as a result of our human centeredness is our ability to kind of separate us from the natural world and from everything else from all the non-human species from all the the, the non-living systems so so i think you know one, one alternative to this will be if, if we look at say for example design there's the idea of planet-centric design you know so the idea that instead of actually putting humans at the center of everything we put the planet at the center of everything now i'd argue but by putting the planet at the center of everything you also put in put in humans at the center of oh, the that, I mean, I had the great joy of um, going to visit Muse School in California earlier this year, and they, they have a really strong, like everything really is around sustainability for them. And sustainability, yes, they talk about the planet, but they actually also talk about inner sustainability, like that's their phrasing for well-being mm. is actually about inner sustainability. So when they have a sustainable focus, on it all yes they're talking seed to table and those types of programs but they're also talking about what works best for us personally and for us as a community and mm -hmm. that's actually i um was speaking with them on friday and that's been a real big push and you know it's been something for them to really grapple onto as they've headed into this whole remote situation and for them they're not looking at being back in school until september yeah yeah yeah, I mean, so I'd even possibly like suggest moving beyond beyond sustainability. So my colleague Chris Jackson and I, we do lots of work outside of education, and we've been talking a lot over the weekend around the conversations that are happening in terms of tourism at the moment. So there's a big thing is like, you know, the tourism industry here in New Zealand and, and many other places is kind of decimated, right? You know, so what we had 
is no longer going to be able to exist in the same form. So tourism leaders have stepped up and said, well, this is our opportunity to become the most sustainable tourism sector in the world. We may say this is the opportunity to become the most sustainable education center, sector or the most sustainable curriculum or rest of it. But sustainability is limited to the fact that it's saying that we're going to sustain things as they are. What, what we have is shit, for want of a better <laughs> we, have, we have a decimated biodiversity. We have a, you know, our waterways are screwed. You know, our, our, our sea, the Hauraki Gulf here in Auckland is completely, you know, decimated. Mm -hmm. you know, literally species functionally extinct that we, we knew just when we were kids. And I'm only 41, so I'm still clinging on to the hope I'm not that old. <laughs> So sustainability simply isn't enough, I don't think. So, you know, the, the phrase that's often been being, being talked about is regenerative, you know, and this is where I think, this is where this idea of pause and think right now, if we're thinking of this as an opportunity to transform, is well, what what do we want it to be? And if we're thinking of it being, um, if we're thinking of education being a central like structure that allows us to reimagine society and to to, to change how we operate, then you know ideas and questions that should be phrased around well what does regenerative mean and that discussion i think is really really important because it then it changes what we know and then changes what we see so going back to that whole phrase at the minute is what we know limits what we can imagine well if we start to know different things as possibilities then we're not only just going to imagine new futures but we'll also be able to notice different people doing interesting things that we would usually not notice those things would usually be in our blind spots because we'd be so busy thinking about how can we create, you know, the the, the next uh, coding thing for this, or how can we do a PBL challenge that's going to coach to individual needs, or how, you know, as opposed to what are the things that we might notice if we're looking more more broadly or more widely. So, for those of us who may not have as much experience at sort of getting into that level of strategic thinking around this. What are some of the first steps that people can do to get into that headspace? Okay, that's a really difficult question to answer in two and a half minutes, but yes. I'll give it yep. a go. So, um, <laughs> so futurists, people that work in the field of strategic foresight, which is what Chris and I do outside mm -hmm. of education, uh, often look to identify what we call situational awareness. So the idea of what we, you know, what we notice. Different people notice mm -hmm. different kinds of stuff. So often business people I work with will be able to talk all day about AI and blockchain. But won't be able to talk so much about politic political changes, regulation changes, environmental impacts, and things like that. So the first thing is to actually sorry to identify well, what are the priorities that we notice? What are the things that we notice? And what are the things that we we don't notice so much? Now that's really hard to do on your own because you're basically trying to ask somebody to to figure out what they don't notice, and you don't know what you don't know, right? So so it usually works, it usually involves you having to work with other people to try to kind of bring together all the things that you notice. And um, so, for example, if I say, oh, these are the stories of things that I'm seeing emerging at the moment, and then all the other people do that at the same time in your team, you can start to classify them in different things. So there's a, there's a framework called Steep V. Steep being social, technological, economic, environmental, political, and then V for values. So you can kind of say, okay, what are the stories that we're seeing at the moment? What are the cool ideas? What are the things that we see, you know, that are scary or so on? You classify them in this steep V framework. And again, I'm doing this really simply. Yeah. Um, but so what are these changes? Are they political, are they social, environmental, and so on? And you look to see well where you have blind spots. And um, you may kind of do something similar with their education. You might kind of say, okay, well, what are the things that we're noticing, how would we classify them? Perhaps they would be to do with subject areas or maybe to do with different priorities that might be connected with the purpose of education. So are these changes that we're seeing, are they towards an economic imperative? Are they towards a well-being imperative? Are they towards, so trying to classify the things that you notice through some kind of framework so you can identify blind spots. By identifying the blind spots, you kind of make that as a, that sort of tacit knowledge more explicit to you. So then you can focus your Google searches and you <laughs> and other things towards those particular areas where you might notice one. So there's, there's some real simple things, but usually the big thing there is that we notice more collectively than we notice individually. And that's why insights that come from across a diverse group of people might be the people in your team, the people you teach with, the members of your leadership group. It might be your parents. It might be your board of trustees. It might be a whole range of other people um, that kind of can feed into that insight and allow you to be more aware of the type of things you notice. Um, but it's really hard and it takes a lot of energy. Yeah. 
And so obviously if this is a place that some of us can can start to to work on together now or you know and if there are um, teachers or teams or leaders that see this interview and they start having a look at this and they've got more got more questions around it there's going to be a lot of stuff that they can read out there around this but also of course if they're in the disrupted network it's easy for them to to reach out to you within here and um, they can possibly ask some questions as they start to play around with this yeah absolutely yeah and and you know there are there are things that you can read and there are also things that we can you can do um and yeah so absolutely people should reach out to me I'm, I'm happy for them to reach out to me directly so my email address um you know it, i won't say it right now but people can <laughs> me on there and i'll, I'll give that out yeah. uh, i'm happy to kind of and um, deal with that sort of stuff so there are lots of techniques things like scenario planning or scenario exploration rather than scenario planning yeah. sorry um, and those kind of things that actually allow us to see things that we wouldn't usually see um, putting ourselves in different worlds and so on and so forth. So there are lots of strategies that can help with that. And just before we do finish up, I also want to just also mention to everyone the Bright Spots um, cool. project that, that you're involved in. And I and I hear there is some, some possibility of us seeing some little TV episodes and things about this. And, and possibility. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know in probably 24 hours so yeah we are yeah. hoping to get some stuff ready for the MOE's TV stuff so we're working on that so, uh, so right now actually so my back room is being converted into a mini TV studio um so yeah there's some stuff there and we are going to be creating some educational resources that are going to be going wider than, than the TV as well so I'll be online um so yeah very really quickly bright sauce is about identifying you know pockets of positivity that, exi that exist in today's world despite all the crisis and drama and, and dystopia uh, and the idea being there is, first of all, identify them, then say, well, what would the world be like if these things came to maturity and became part of our new normal? Uh, and then use that as a process of creating scenarios for better futures so we can identify the actions we can take now and in the near future to make those things more likely. Um, so we are working with, with school leaders to try to do the same sort of thing for education as well. So that might be something that people are keen to get involved with to yeah. just head, but yeah. Brilliant. That's a nice uplifting way for us to, yeah. to to end the quick discussion this morning. It is only a real taster of these things, but hopefully it does give people a, a little bit of a prompt as to where they can can start heading to make sure they they make some really good positive moves right now. Yeah, cool. Oh, best of luck to everyone and uh, everyone staying safe. Yeah, and thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, for those of you who this may be one of the first episodes of this of these disrupted interviews that you've watched, please do subscribe. We are uploading them every um, every day. So if you so either you can see them coming up here in the Facebook group, or if you subscribe on YouTube, then every morning you're going to get a little ping in your email with the with the next interview. So again, thank you very much, Chris, and um, to the rest of you, have a wonderful day. Thanks, man.